Hey, in this video, I'm going to be teaching you how to make a simple Metroidvania slash platformer for the playdate. This is basically a simplified version of a game I just finished making called The King's Dungeon. Here's what the final result will look like. As you can see, you can run and jump. There's some hazards if you hit will reset you back to the beginning of the level. And there's some ability pickups that you can pick up that will give you new abilities. So the abilities I'll be covering today are the double jump and also the dash. Um, and also, if I run over to the side over here, you'll see that you can actually switch between levels. Once I hit the edge of the screen, you can go to uh, different rooms. I'll also be showing you how to set up LDTK so you can visually create these levels and it'll automatically turn it into a playdate level. This is more of an intermediate or advanced tutorial and I'll try to explain everything as I go, but if you're a beginner at playdate development, I recommend you check out some of my other tutorials. If you've never programmed before, I recommend checking out these two videos, Learn to Program for Playdate Game Dev. This should teach you all the basics for learning how to code in Lua. These two videos are a little bit high level though, so if you wanna go in more depth, I would recommend checking out my book, The Beginner's Guide to Lua for Game Development. This goes in more detail and should take you from an absolute beginner to an understanding of the Lua programming language. If you haven't set up your Playdate development environment yet, I would recommend checking out this video, Getting Started with the Playdate SDK. It's a tiny bit outdated and I'll be making an update to that video soon, so you might see a newer version by the time you're watching this video. And lastly, I'll be assuming you have an understanding of collisions, sprites, and object-oriented programming for the Playdate. Those are these three videos, so I'd recommend checking that out before you watch this tutorial. With that out of the way, we can get started. All right, so the first thing that we actually wanna do is start off by creating the level. In order to create the level, we're gonna be using something called LDTK, also known as Level Designer Toolkit. I'll link this in the description, but you can head over to ldtk.io and press this big download button. After you have that installed, we're gonna be needing some art assets. So the assets you need are first, a tile set. We're gonna be using a 16 by 16 tile set for this video. 16 by 16 is actually a little bit small for the screen of the playdate, but for demonstration purposes, I think it's okay. You're also gonna need two images for uh, the spike and the spike ball, a sprite sheet with the player with the idle state, a running state, and a jump state, and two icons for the dash and double jump abilities. Of course, you can use your own art assets, but you can also just use the ones that I'm using. The ones I'm using are adapted from Kenny's 1-bit platformer pack. To get it formatted how I have it, you can just go over to the GitHub link that I have linked in the description, and you can go to code, download the zip file, and unzip it to get the images. We're basically gonna be starting off with a blank project, but here's the file structure that you should have. Under the source folder, you have an images folder with all the images except for the tile map. For that, you'll have a folder called levels and put the tile map inside there. Make sure you have the tile map named something like this. The dash table dash 16 dash 16 is actually a specific naming convention that the Playdate SDK uses to tell how big each tile should be. Next, we wanna be hopping over to LDTK and creating a new project. So click new and navigate over to the folder that you have your Playdate project in. Once you're in the folder, you actually wanna click on the levels folder and go inside and name it to something like world. We've created a new project, but you might notice that the sizing is a bit off. The Playdate screen is 400 pixels by 240 pixels wide. And how we wanna set up is that each level is equivalent to one screen on the Playdate. We can change that by going up here to the current level settings and changing the size to 400 by 240 pixels. The problem is, however, every time you create a new level, it'll default to this size. So what we can do is go over here to world settings in the top left and change default new level size to 400 by 240 pixels. Now, if you right click and create a new level, it'll be sized correctly. Next thing we wanna do is actually pull up the tile set. So let's go up to the top left and click tile sets and create a new tile set. It should automatically open up the levels folder and you should be able to see the tile set that you have saved in there. Let's go ahead and open that tile set. Now that we created the tile set, there are certain tiles that we wanna mark as unpassable terrain in the tile set. This won't make that much sense now, but will make more sense later once we get into it. But let's go into the enums and create a new enum. Let's call this enum tile enum and select the tile set, this tile set that we just created. Next, let's add a new value and call this value solid. Then we can go back to the tile set, click enum for tile marking, go to tile enum, click on solid, and we can mark all these tiles as solid. We'll be using this data later as we set up the tile map in our game. Next, we wanna be able to actually draw our tiles. 
For that, we'll go into layers and let's create a new layer. Let's select integer grid as our layer type. We can call this layer walls. We need to set a tile set on this layer, so let's go down to select a tile set and click the tile set that we created. You can see on the side here, it says edit rules. Go ahead and click that. We want to have two groups. The first group will just be an empty group and it'll be the background. Click on this plus button to add a new rule and we can click on this square in order to open up the tile set. Let's select the background tile and leave it like so. As you can see, the background is now filled up. Next, we want to be able to draw the walls, so let's create another group called walls. This time, let's use the assistant. The assistant will help us with something called auto tiling, where you can just click and drag and it'll automatically select the right tiles to draw. This isn't really an LDTK tutorial per se, so I won't be going too in depth with this, but I'll just show you the basics. For these nine squares, you can just match it to these nine squares. So let's click and fill them all in. These three squares will map to these three squares, so let's fill that in. These three vertical squares will match to these ones, so let's fill that in next. And lastly, the single square maps to this one. Now we can create rules. If you did it correctly and you click and draw, it should automatically tile the tiles for you. We can delete all this by holding shift and clicking right click and dragging. Let's just create a simple level with a floor and some walls. Go ahead and save this and we'll come back to this later. Let's go back to the project and actually start coding. For this project, we're gonna be needing two external libraries to help. I'm gonna create a new folder called scripts to house all our scripts and another folder called libraries to house our libraries. I'll have these linked in the description, but the two libraries are Animated Sprite by Whitebrim and Playdate LDTK Importer by Nick Magnier. What the Playdate LDTK importer does is take this giant world.ldtk file and actually converts it into a Playdate tile map. What Animated Sprite does is it allows us to create something called a state machine. We'll be using that later for the player controller. To add these libraries, it's actually really simple. Let's go to the libraries folder and create two new files, one called Animated Sprite and another one called LDTK. Then we can go over to the GitHub pages and just copy paste the code. For animated sprite, click the animated sprite.lua file, click here to copy, and go back to the project and paste it in. For LDTK, it's basically the same thing. Go to LDTK.lua, copy it, and paste it in. Next, let's set up the main file. Go over to main.lua and we're going to be importing some libraries. The first are the core libraries. The four core libraries that we need are object, graphics, sprites, and timer. These are from the Playdate SDK. Next, we're gonna be importing the libraries that we just added. To do that, we can just import the paths to those libraries. Next, we can just set our Playdate constants and create our update function. Since we'll be using the sprite system and the timer system, we'll wanna be updating them both in the main update loop. Next, we wanna actually create our main game scene. Let's create a new file and call it game scene. We can go back to main.lua and we'll import the game scene like so. In the game scene, let's start off by creating some constants. The first constant we'll need is just the graphics constant again, and the next one is the actual LDTK library. To actually load the level, it's as easy as this calling the load function on the LDTK library and passing in the path to our world. The second parameter is something called use Lua levels. I'll explain this later, but we'll just set it to false for now. The loading function loads the data for the world.ldtk file, but doesn't actually create anything visual on the screen. So we're gonna need to do that ourselves. For that, let's create a game scene. I'm gonna create the game scene as a class. That's an object-oriented programming concept, and as I mentioned before, there's a video that I made on it. But you don't really have to understand how it works, but just follow along. First, we'll create the game scene class and then create an initialization function. Next, we're gonna create a helper method called goToLevel. This is what we'll call every time we wanna to go to a new level in the world, as well as the first level in the game. 
we'll pass in the name of the level. Every time we go to a new level, we want to clear out the old level. And since everything is going to be made out of sprites, what we can do is just remove all the sprites. Next, what we want to do is actually loop through all the layers in the LDTK world and create a tile map for each layer. If we go back to LDTK, the layers are like so. We actually only have one layer, but we're going to loop through a list of all the layers anyways, just in case you add more layers later. To go through the layers, we can start off by creating a for loop. In the LDTK library, we can call the get layers function to get all the layers for a level. Next, we can check if the layer has any tiles, which it should, and we can actually create the tile map. To create the tile map, it's actually super simple. We can call another function called create tile map. Then we can pass in the level name and the layer name. I know this might seem a little bit confusing, but honestly, the implementation details are not that important. So you can just copy along and it'll end up working. Next, we're going to be creating a sprite for each layer and setting the tile map on that sprite. Let's start off by creating a new sprite. What this tile map is, is the playdate tile map object in the SDK. What we can do with tile maps is actually set it onto a sprite to have the sprite draw the tile map. So let's do that next. We can do that by using the set tile map method. Next, we want to move the sprite to the correct location. So we can do that by setting the center to the top left of the sprite. And then moving it to the top left. This way, the sprite is covering the whole screen. Next, each layer is actually automatically assigned a Z index by LDTK, so we can set that on the layer sprite. Lastly, we just need to add the sprite. I forgot to add a do to the end of this for loop, so let's go back and do that real quick. We're almost done with this, we just need to create the collision boxes. To do that, we need to do a series of specific steps. The first is we need to get the empty tiles. The empty tiles are all the tiles that aren't filled with a tile. Luckily, we can do that automatically with a function called get empty tile IDs from the LDTK library. Let's create a new variable called empty tiles and call the empty tile ID function. We'll pass in the level name, and next, crucially, we're going to need that enum that we set before to set the tiles as solid. This solid is coming from here. We're passing this in to make sure that we get every tile that's not solid. And lastly, let's pass in the layer name. Finally, we can check if there's any empty tiles, and if so, we can actually create the collision boxes. We can do so by calling the add wall sprites function. For this function, let's pass in the tile map and the empty tiles. In LDTK, you'll notice that there's a level name at the top. That's the name of each level. So in the init method, let's go to level zero. And then we want to make sure that we go in the main.lua file and actually create the game scene object. Finally, we can actually try running the game. If everything was done properly, you should be able to see the tile map on the screen. And if you go to view and show sprite collisions, it should show you the collision boxes for the tile map. Now that that's set up, let's actually create the player controller. To create the player, let's start off by creating a new player script. At the top, we'll add our basic constants for playday and playday.graphics, and we'll be creating a new class for the player. This time, however, we'll be doing something a little special and we'll be actually extending the animated sprite library. As mentioned before, the animated sprite library implements something called a state machine. So here's a high level overview of what a state machine is. 
In the state machine, you have separate states. For example, the standing state, the jumping state, or the running state. And you have transitions between those states. For example, if you're in the standing state and you press A, it'll bring you to the jumping state. But if you press nothing, it'll bring you back to the standing state. Let's go back to the code and implement this state machine. We'll start off by creating an init method and passing in the player position. Next, we'll get the image table for the player. We can do that by creating a local variable and calling the image table.new constructor. Let's pass in the path to our player table. If you remember, the player sprite sheet looks like this. There are four separate frames. The first one is an idle frame, these two are running, and this last one is a jumping frame. To set the image table on the sprite, what we do is call this line of code. What the super.init does is it actually calls the initialization method of the animated sprite. Uh, the syntax is a little bit complicated, but you don't really need to understand how that works. Next, let's create some states. We can do that by calling the addState method, which is something that exists on the animated sprite library. The first state will be the idle animation. In this addState method, what we do is we pass in the starting frame and the ending frame. Since the idle state is just the first frame, the starting frame will be one and the ending frame will be one as well. Next state we want to add is a running state. For the running state, we'll have it running from the first frame all the way to the third frame. Since the run is actually an animated state, we need to set how fast the animation should be. The tick step is how many ticks each frame should last. We can set it by passing in a table and passing in a key called tick step. We will set the tick step to four because for the speed of the animation, we want each frame to last four ticks. If you go to the animated sprite GitHub page, there's some documentation and there's actually a lot of configuration parameters you can set on each state. There's a lot to explore, but we won't be going into detail for this tutorial. For the final state, we'll add a jump state. The jump state is just the last frame. The last step for the states is we need to actually call something called the play animation method. This makes sure that the animations are actually being played. After this, let's set some basic sprite properties. First, let's move the player to the X and Y position. After that, we'll want to set a Z index. You could put a number here, but what I'd like to do is set a global Z indexes table to organize everything. Let's go back to the game scene, and at the top of the game scene, we'll create a Z indexes table. We'll set a key on this table and set the value to 100. Now, if we go back here, we can call the Z indexes global variable and set it to player. And this will automatically be converted to 100. Likewise, we also want to set a tag on the player for collisions later. So what we can do is do the same thing and create a global tags table. For the player, we'll set the tag to one. And here we can set, set tag and call our tags global variable. Last thing for the sprite properties is we actually want to set a collision rect. For the sprite collision rec, you typically wanted to have it actually a little bit smaller than the player. Let's set the collision box something like this. The top left point will be 3, 3, which is 3 to the right and 3 down, and we'll have it with a width of 10 and a height of 13. If we go back to the player script, we can call set collide rec with those numbers. This collide rect is using the built-in SDK collision library. Next, let's create some physics properties. What we're gonna be doing is actually simulating physics for the player. There's no built-in way to handle physics, so we're gonna have to do it ourselves. It might seem complicated, but it's actually not too difficult. We first wanna keep track of the player X velocity. We'll set it to zero for now since the player is not moving. Next, we also wanna keep track of the Y velocity. 
setting it to zero as well. Next, we need a gravity constant. I'll set gravity to one for now, but you can tweak this value based on what you like. Then we'll also set a max speed variable to dictate how fast the player can go. I'll set it to two for now. Lastly, we wanna keep track of some special player state. The first thing we need to keep track of is whether the player is touching the ground. If you watch my collisions video, you'll know that we need to set a collision response on the sprite. We can do that by overriding the collision response method. For now, we can just return to slide response, but we'll be coming back to this later. Next, let's create an update loop for the player. First, we want to call update animation. This update animation method actually belongs to the animated sprite library. And this just makes sure that everything in the state machine is updated properly. If you recall from my sprite video, this update method gets called on any sprite automatically if it's added to the draw list. And it's called by the sprite.update function in the main update loop. This init function on the animated sprite library automatically adds the sprite to the draw list, so that's handled for us. Next, let's do a little trick I like to do, which is calling some functions that don't exist yet for what we want to do, and then implement it later. This will help us organize things in our head. The first thing we want to do is handle the different states. Next, what we want to do is handle movement and collisions. Let's first implement the handle state method. We can get what state we're in currently using the current state property. This is automatically set by the animated sprite library. In this first block, we'll check if we're in the idle state. Then we want to check if we're in the run state. And then lastly, the jump. Let's first start off by just implementing the idle and run state. We'll do that same trick again and call some methods that don't exist yet. In the idle state, we'll first want to apply gravity. And then we want to handle input. In the run state, we'll actually want to be doing the same thing. Before we implement those methods, however, let's first implement handle movement and collisions. In the handle movement and collisions method, we can start off by actually moving the player. To do so, we can call the move with collisions method. If you recall from my collisions video, this moves the player taking collisions into consideration. Move with collisions takes in a point that we want to move the player to. Where we want to move the player is the current position offset by their velocity. And as you recall, we created an X velocity and Y velocity property. So we can use those now. Move with collisions returns four values, the actual X and Y position of the player after the collision, an array of collisions and the length of the collision array. We can store those in local variables. We don't need the first two, so we can just use underscores for those. The collisions array is an array that has information about everything that we bumped into. So let's loop through that collisions array. Let's store the current collision in the loop with a local collision variable. What we want to do here is check if the player is touching the ground. We can do that by checking the collision normal. The collision normal is stored in the normal property. 
But specifically with the normal, we want the vertical normal, so we get the y component of that normal. If what we're colliding into is below us, aka the floor, then the collision normal will equal negative 1. So if we're in this conditional, we know that we're touching the ground, so we can set touching ground to true. But if we never touch the ground, that conditional will never be called, and touching ground should be false. So we can set it to false at the start of the loop. I realize I haven't explained what the normal is exactly, but the normal is basically a vector that's perpendicular to the surface that you're touching. Let's go through this one more time. The smooth with collisions method will move the player based off of the x velocity and y velocity, and we'll get a collisions array based off of what the player touched. If the player touches anything that has a y normal of negative 1, aka the ground, then we set touching ground to true. However, if we never touch anything that is the ground, then touching ground will be false. We'll use this touching ground property to set our y velocity later. Next, let's implement that handle ground input method. In this method, we'll be actually checking the player inputs. So we can first check if the player is pressing left. If the player is pressing left, let's change them to the run state. Again, let's call a method that doesn't quite exist yet and we'll implement it later. We'll pass in left to let the method know that we're moving left. Next, we can do the same thing for when the player is pressing right. Notice how we're using button is press instead of button just press. This is because in the situation where the player is in another state and then turns into the idle or run state and they're already pressing the left or right button, we anticipate that they start running. You can imagine this as a cheap way to add input buffering. Lastly, if they're not pressing either of those, we'll change them back to the idle state. Again, let's create a method that doesn't quite exist yet. Let's go ahead and implement those state transition methods. First, changing to the idle state. This will be a really short method. First, we want to set the x velocity to zero and actually change the state. We can do that by calling the change state method and passing in the string of the state. This is a method that belongs to the animated sprite library. Next, let's implement the change to run state. If you recall, we passed in left and right, so let's take that in as a property. If the direction is left, we want to change the x velocity to move the player to the left. We can do that by setting the x velocity to the negative of max speed. Otherwise, if the direction is right, then we can do the opposite. Lastly, we'll actually change the state. Finally, we have one last method to implement, which is apply gravity. Here, what we want to do is just add gravity to the y velocity. However, if the player is touching the ground, we just set the y velocity to zero. We're almost ready to test the player, but we actually haven't created the player anywhere yet. So let's first start off by going to the main file and importing the player. 
Next, let's go to the game scene and actually initialize the player. We'll store the player into a player property and we'll be using this later. Next, we have to decide where to spawn the player. Let's go back to the LDTK. I'm gonna create this little platform in the middle and let's place a player right here. In order to know where this is, you can look at the bottom right and you can see the position of this location. On the grid, it's on position X equals 12 and Y equals five. Let's go back to our code and create two properties, spawn X and spawn Y. We'll set those to the grid values that we saw before. However, these are just the grid values, not the actual position, so we need to multiply it by 16 based off the tile size. Then we can pass in spawn X and spawn Y to the player. Let's try building this now. I got an error with the code. I actually meant to write this as move to on line 17, so let's fix that real quick. Make sure you save the LDTK file in order for it to update. As you can see, you can now move the player around and the player will be animated, and you can run off the ledge and the player will fall as you expect. However, there's one small issue, which is the player is not facing the way that you're moving, so let's fix that real quick. In the handle movement and collisions method, let's check what the X velocity is. If the X velocity is less than zero, let's flip the player. We can flip the player image by setting the global flip property. This is a property that exists on the animated sprite library. To flip horizontally, we'll set it to one. However, if the X velocity is greater than zero, then we'll set it back to be unflipped. We also need to set the flip when we're changing into the run state as well. Now if we run and build this, we can see that the player is facing the correct direction. Let's add jumping next. To implement jumping, let's first set a new property. We'll call this property jump velocity and set it to some value. I'll set this as negative six, but you can change it if you like. The number is negative because as you're moving up on the playdate coordinate system, it goes more negative. Next, let's add some code to the jump state. First, let's check if we're touching the ground. If so, we'll switch to the idle state. Next, we'll apply gravity in the state. And lastly, let's create a new method to handle input called to handle air input. Let's go ahead and create that handle air input method. In this state, we'll just keep checking if the player is pressing left and keep moving the player left and vice versa. Next, we want to create a new state transition method to change the jump state. In this transition, we want to set the y velocity to the jump velocity. And next, we want to change the state to the jump state. Lastly, in handle ground input, we'll check if the A button is being pressed and we'll change to the jump state. Notice how I opted to use button just press in this case instead. If we build and run this, you'll see that jumping is working. The running and jumping is almost complete, but you'll notice that there are actually a few issues. The first issue is that the player keeps moving at full speed in the direction that you're facing, even after you let go of the direction key. 
This is not the biggest issue, but you would expect the player slows down a little bit if you let go of the direction, so we can fix that by adding some drag in the air. The next issue is if you run towards a wall, jump and then let go, the player still moves forward. This also isn't the biggest issue, but you would expect that the wall stops your X velocity completely, so we can fix that by checking if we're touching a wall. And the last issue is a slightly bigger one, which is you keep moving up even after you touch a ceiling. This is pretty weird because you get this effect where it looks like you're stuck to the ceiling. We can fix this by checking if you're touching a ceiling. Let's go back to the code and try to address all those issues. To start off, let's go back to the code and add a couple more properties. The first property we want to add is a drag constant. This is how much the player will be slowing down every frame in the air. The next constant we want to add is a minimum airspeed. This is just the minimum speed in the air that the player will stop moving. Next, let's add a couple more state variables to check if the player is touching the ceiling or the wall. In the jump state, we'll create a method to apply drag in the air. Next, in the handle movement and collisions method, we'll check if we're touching the ceiling or the wall. First, let's set the touching ceiling and touching wall properties to false. We can check if we're touching the ceiling or wall by just checking the collision normals again. If we're touching the ceiling, then the collision normal for the Y value should be 1. If we're touching a wall, then the collision normal on the X axis can be either negative 1 or 1, so we can just check if the collision normal on the X axis is not 0. To fix the issue when we're touching the ceiling, all we have to do is add an OR statement and check if we're touching the ceiling here. To fix the other issues, let's implement the apply drag method. We're passing in a drag argument here, so let's make sure to add that property. Applying drag is really easy. If the x velocity is greater than zero, then we can subtract the drag amount, and if it's less than zero, then we can add the drag amount. There could be a small issue where the x velocity is a really small amount, so subtracting or adding the drag will push it past zero. And if that happens, the x velocity might ping pong back and forth. So let's add a check to fix that. The fix is to check if the absolute value of our x velocity is less than the minimum airspeed. And if so, we just set the x velocity to zero. This will also be a good place to set the velocity to zero if we're touching a wall, so we can just add that here. If we build and run it, we can see that all three issues are fixed. There's a little bit of drag in the air. If we run towards a wall, jump and let go, it doesn't move forward. And also, if we run and jump against the ceiling, then it'll immediately set the velocity to zero. The next thing we're going to do is add double jumping and dashing. To start off, let's create some more properties. The first two properties are just to track whether we have the abilities unlocked or not. The next are some ability specific properties. For the double jump, we just need a variable to keep track of whether or not we have the double jump available. For the dash, we're gonna have a dash available property as well, but along with that, we're gonna need a speed for the dash. 
I'm also going to add two other properties called dash minimum speed and dash drag. How this is going to work is every frame, the dash speed is going to be reduced by the dash drag until we hit the dash minimum speed and then the dash will end. Of course, we need a dash state as well, so let's add that up at the top. For the animation, I'm just going to use the same frame as a jump. In the handle state method, let's handle the dash state. While we're dashing, we don't want to apply gravity, but we do want to apply drag, but this time with the dash drag. While we're in the dash state, we'll check if the x velocity is less than our dash minimum speed, and if so, we'll change to a falling state. I created another non-existent method called change to false state, so let's implement that now. If you notice, we don't actually have a false state, but the false state is basically the same as the jump state, but without applying the jump velocity. So let's do that. While we're here, we might as well implement the change to dash state method. So let's do that now. First thing we want to do when we enter the dash state is set the dash available to false since we used it up and set the y velocity to zero. Next, we want to set the x velocity. What we'll do is check if the left button is being pressed, and if so, we'll set the x velocity to the negative of the dash speed. And if the right button is being pressed, we'll set it to the dash speed. However, if no button is being pressed, we'll just check what direction the player is facing using the global flip property and set the x velocity that way. Lastly, we'll change the state to the dash state. Next, let's go into our input handler methods and actually allow us to change into these states. In the ground input, we'll check three things. If the B button is being pressed, if we have a dash available, and we also unlock the dash ability. And if so, we'll change to the dash state. While we're in the air, to handle a double jump, we'll check three things. If the A button is being pressed, if a double jump is available, and if we've unlocked a double jump ability. If all these conditions are true, what we want to do is set the double jump available to false and change to the jump state. Next, we do want to be able to dash in the air, so let's just copy paste this over. Lastly, we've been setting double jump available to false and dash available to false, so we need to set it to true at some point. We can do that here when we touch the ground. If we build and run the game, you should be able to double jump now and dash.
For our next task, we want to be able to switch in between different rooms, so let's do that next. To test switching in between different levels, we're going to need to create a new level first in LDTK, so let's do that. To do that, what you want to do is just right click on an empty space and click new level. We have a new level, but it's currently not aligned with the original level, so what you want to do is zoom out a little bit and click and drag until they're aligned. Then we can zoom back in and create a little passageway. So on the first level, I'll create this little corridor here and move over to the next level. What you want to do is create some terrain and make sure that aligns with the other level. I'll hold shift and click and drag in order to create some walls. Then you can shape the room however you like. I'll create another level below this level by doing the same thing. I'm liking how this looks right now, so I'm going to save and go back to the code. The first thing we want to do in the code is actually go to the game scene file and create a method that will allow us to enter a new room. I'll create a new method here and call it enter room. For the properties, we're going to take in an argument called direction. In order to get the neighboring level, what we can do is call the LDTK get neighbors function. In order to get the neighbors of the level, we actually need the name of the current level. So what we can do is store the level name in a property. We can do that in the go to level method. Then going back to this method, let's pass in the level name. We also want to pass in the direction as well. This returns an array of all the neighboring levels in that direction. But since we only have one neighbor per direction, we can just get the first element. Next, we can call go to level on that new level. When we call go to level, it actually removes all the sprites, including the player. So what we want to do is add the player back in. Then we need to determine where to move the player. So what's going to happen is when the player touches the edge of the screen, we're actually going to teleport the player to the opposite side and then change the level. So it's going to look like the player is moving from level to level. I'm going to write out a bunch of conditionals to determine where to spawn the player. Here's what the conditionals are doing. If we're moving up or down, we actually want to maintain the player X position. But if we're moving up, we want to move the player to the bottom of the screen. And if we're moving down, then we want to move the player to the top of the screen. If we're moving left or right, we want to preserve the player Y position. If we're moving east, we want to move the player to the left of the screen. And if we're moving west, then we want to move the player to the right of the screen. Next step is to actually move the player. Lastly, we need to save these spawn locations for when we want to respawn the player later. We want to be able to call this enter room method from the player script. So what we want to do is actually pass in the game manager into the player. We can do that by passing in a new argument, which is self. The self is referring to the instance of the game scene. Back in the player script, let's add a new parameter called game manager. We can store this game manager into a property. Next, in handle movement and collisions, we can check if the player should be moving to a new room. I'm going to write a few conditionals to check if we need to enter a new room. What this is doing is checking if the player has moved outside of the bounds of the screen. If the player has moved past the left edge of the screen, what we want to do is enter the level to the west of the current level. If the player has moved past the right edge of the screen, what we want to do is move the player to the level on the east. And the same thing is happening on the y-axis. If we build and run the game, we can see that if we try entering a different room, it works flawlessly. If you test it, you should see that it works in all directions.
If you move into a new room, you'll notice that the player state is actually conserved. This is because we're not remaking the player, but rather just teleporting the player to the opposite end of the screen. But the effect is very convincing. Right now there's no challenge in the game, so let's add some hazards that can reset the player. In order to create the hazards, we're gonna first need to create the hazards inside the level editor. So let's go back to LDTK. The hazards are gonna work a little bit differently than the tiles because we're gonna use something called entities. Let's create some entities. Let's go to the top and click on the entities tab. Go ahead and create a new entity and we'll call this one spike. You can see that there's a lot of options here, but right now we're not concerned with any of them. You can, however, change the color or something if you like. Next, we'll create the spike ball. Let's create another entity and call this one spike ball. For the spike ball, I like changing the shape, so let's change this from a rectangle to an ellipse. For the spike ball, we're actually gonna to need to add some custom fields. So let's add two custom fields, the x velocity and the y velocity. For that, we'll create a new single value and make it a float. We'll call this field x velocity. You can keep everything here the same. Let's create another single value, also a float, and call this one y velocity. In order to place down entities, we're gonna need a new layer. So let's go to layers, we'll add a new layer, and make it an entities layer. We can just keep the identifier as entities. Now we can close out of this layer. If you did it properly, you should be able to place down entities. Let's create a couple of spikes, and we'll also add a spike ball right here. The y velocity and x velocity is gonna determine how fast the spike ball moves. To make it move up and down, we'll just set the y velocity to one. You can go ahead and save the project and we'll go back to the code. To create the spike and spike ball, we're gonna need some new scripts. So let's create two new scripts called spike and spike ball. Make sure to go into the main file and import the files. For the hazards, we're gonna need some new tags and Z indexes, so let's add that here. We'll create a tag called hazard and set it to two. And then we can create another Z index called hazard and let's set it to something like 20. I'll implement this spike first. At the top, let's create a new graphics constant And we'll create a new constant for the image of the spike. The reason is we'll be reusing the same spike image so we can just load it up in the beginning. I'll create a new constant called spike image. And set it to a new image with a path to the spike image. Then we'll create a new class for the spike. And this time we'll just be extending the sprite class. For the init method, we'll just take in a location. Then we need to just set a bunch of boring properties like the Z index, the image, the location, and add it to the draw list. However, if you move to XY, it'll just be offset because of the pivot point. If you go back to LDDK, you might notice this little dot in the top left corner. If you go into entities and look at the pivot point, it's pointing to the top left. So we need to do the same thing in our code as well. Let's make sure to set the center to the top left. Next, let's set the hazard tag on the sprite. And lastly, we wanna set a collision rect. I'm thinking of having the collision rect look something like this. So the top left corner is two nine, and it'll have a width of 12 and a height of seven. Let's go ahead and set that collision rect. With that finished, let's go ahead and implement the spike ball. Again, we'll create our graphics constant and the spike ball image. We'll create a new class for the spike ball as well. In the init method, we'll also take the x and y position, but we'll take in a third property called entity. 
This entity property is pretty interesting. This is going to come from the LDTK library, and it's going to give information about the entity. Let's see what we're working with here. This is the data that we have access to. The name of the entity, the position, the center, the size, the Z index, and a bunch of custom properties. The X and Y position is going to come from this position, and we're going to be accessing the X velocity and Y velocity that we set in LDTK using these field properties. It'll make more sense once we actually implement it. First, let's basically do the same thing that we're doing in this spike class. However, instead of spike image, we'll use spike ball image. And then we'll also have a different collision rect. For the spike ball collision rect, I'm thinking of having it something like this. The top left corner is 4, 4 with a width of 8 and a height of 8. I'll go ahead and implement that now. Next, we want to be able to access these x velocity and y velocity fields. As I mentioned before, that's stored in the entity. We can get the fields by just accessing the entity fields property. Then we can save the x and y velocity properties. One interesting thing about the spike ball is we want it to bounce between different walls, so let's set the collision response to be bounce. We can do that by overriding the collision response method again. If we just do this though, what we'll run into is a small issue. Basically, if the player is standing right below the spike ball, and the spike ball runs into the player, the ball will stop. So we need to check if we're bumping into a player, and instead return the overlap collision type. Luckily, the collision response method actually has an argument called other that returns the sprite that you're colliding into. What we can do is check the tag of the other sprite. And if the tag is the player tag, we know that we need to overlap that sprite. We can get the tag by just calling the get tag method. Last thing we want to do is actually move the spike ball. So let's do that now. We'll move the spike ball inside the update loop. We can do the same thing that we're doing with the player, which is calling the move with collisions method. The reason that we're checking the collisions is we want to see if we're touching a wall. We can do that by looping over all the collisions and seeing if we hit something that's not the player. If we're hitting a wall, then what we want to do is just reverse the x and y velocity. We can do that by multiplying them by negative 1. With that, the spike ball script is complete. Let's go back to the player script and handle the state where the player hits a hazard. First, we want to have a property to check if the player is dead, so we'll create that now. If the player is dead, we shouldn't update anything, so let's just return from the update method if the player is dead. This way, if the player is dead, we'll immediately return from the update method and none of this will be run. Next, we want to update the collision response to overlap with the spike ball, just like we did in the spike ball script, so let's do that. First, let's create a variable died and set it to false. Next, we want to be able to get the collision type and the collision tag. We can get the collision type by just getting the type property. In order to get the tag, we need to first get the object the player is colliding with, and we can get that with collision.other. Then we can get the tag by calling get tag on the collision object. We only want to be doing these collision checks if we're touching a wall, so what we can do is check if the collision type is the type slide and do these checks. Next, we can check if the collision tag is a hazard, and if so, we can set die to true. 
At the end of this movement and collisions method, we can check if the player died, and if so, we can call a die function. Let's go ahead and implement that die function right now. If the player has hit a hazard, what we want to do is set the x and y velocity to zero and set the dead property to true. After that, we want to make sure that the player doesn't collide with anything else, so let's set collisions enabled to false. What I want the player to do when they hit a hazard is to freeze slightly and then reset back to the beginning of the level. To have them freeze slightly, let's just create a perform after delay timer and create a callback function. What this will do is wait 200 milliseconds and then perform whatever's in this function after that. After the delay is over, we'll re-enable collisions, set the dead property to false, and reset the player. In order to reset the player, we're going to need the game scene because the game scene is the one that stores where the player spawned. So let's call a non-existent property called reset player on the game manager. Then we can go over to the game scene and implement that function. To reset the player, we'll just move the player to spawn X and spawn Y. There's one last thing we need to do in the game scene, which is actually spawning in the entities. Let's do that now. We can do that in the go to level method. We can get all the entities in a level by calling the getEntities function on the LDDK library. We can then write a for loop to loop through all those entities. As I mentioned before, this is what the format of the entities will look like. So first, let's get the entity position. Next, we'll get the name of the entity. We can check if the entity is a spike or spike ball based on the name and spawn a spike and spike ball respectively. The name of the entity that we're checking against comes from here, the entity identifier on the entity in LDTK. Make sure to place some entities in your level and if you build and run the game, you should see this. If you run and hit one of the spikes, it'll reset you back to the beginning of the level. If you have a spike ball in the level, you should see it bouncing in between the walls. And if you hit it, it should reset you back to the beginning of the level. Now that we have the hazards implemented, let's add ability pickups. To create the ability pickup, let's create a new entity. I'll create a new entity and call this ability. Let's change this to a light blue color, and an ellipse. For the ability pickup, we'll create a new custom field that'll store what the ability should be. What we could do is have a custom string field and have that string determine which ability it should be. But it's a little easy to forget which string you decided to use, especially if you have a lot of abilities, so let's create something called an enum. To create an enum, let's go to the top and click the enum tab. If you remember, we already created an enum for the tiles. For this new enum, we'll just call it abilities. For the first enum value, we'll set it to dash. And the second one, we'll set it to double jump. Then if we go back to entities and click ability, we can add a new single value, which is an enum. Then we can pick the existing abilities enum. Then when you set an ability down, it'll prompt you to select the ability that you want. And this way you can just have a custom dropdown list. That's all we need to do in LDTK for now, so let's go back to the code. For the pickup, I'm going to create a new file called ability. I'll create the graphics constant at the top again and create a new class called ability. This time we'll be extending the sprite class as well. Before we do anything, let's make sure to go back to the main file and import the ability script. 
Just like the spike ball in the init method, we'll be taking in the position as well as the entity itself. Just like the hazards, we're going to need a new tag and Z index. So let's go back to the game scene. I'll go ahead and create a tag called pickup and set it to three and create a new Z index for the pickup and set it to something like 50. For the ability, we'll get the fields at the top. And then we'll get the ability name from the fields. Next, we need to get the image for the ability. I purposely named the images the same thing as the enum in order to make this really simple so we can just concatenate the ability name onto the image path. Of course, not having a hard-coded path might lead to some issues if you have a bug in your code, so let's assert the ability image after. This is just to make sure that the image that we're getting actually exists. Next, we need to do all the basic things like setting the image, the z-index, the pivot point, moving the image, and adding it to the draw list. Lastly, we'll set the tag in the collision rect. For the collision rect, I actually want it to be the same size as the image, so we can use the get size method for that. Next, we need to create a method to allow the player to pick up the ability. When we pick up an ability, what we want it to do is go in the player script and set these values to true. So what we need is actually a reference to the player. We'll set that up by setting a player property. And later when the player calls this method, they can pass themselves in. Then we can set the correct ability to true based on the ability name. If the ability name is double jump, then we can set the double jump ability to true. And if the ability name is dash, then we can set the dash ability to true. The ability names, if you remember, is coming from the enum values. Then after the player has picked up the ability, we can just remove it. Next, since we have some new entities, we want to make sure that we're spawning it. So let's go back to the game scene and spawn the ability entity. Next, we need to change the player script to allow the player to interact with pickups. First, let's set these ability flags to false. Next, if the tag is a pickup tag, we'll also be overlapping them. And lastly, in the handle movement and collisions method, if the collision tag is the pickup tag, then we should call the pickup method on the object. As mentioned before, we need to make sure that we pass in the player so the ability has a reference to it. So let's pass in self. I ran and built the code and I realized I made a mistake. This ability field doesn't match the name in LDTK, so let's change that. Let's rename this field identifier to ability. Now if you build and run the game, you'll see that you start off the game with no double jump and no dash. However, if you pick up the dash ability, you'll be able to dash now. And next, if you pick up the double jump ability, you'll be able to double jump. However, there's one small issue. Whenever you pick up an ability, it removes it properly. However, if you leave the room and come back, the abilities respawn. Let's fix that now. To do that, we need to create a new property. Let's go back to LDTK and create a Boolean and named it picked up. Make sure to save the LDTK project. Back in the ability script, what we can do is check that picked up field. If that field is true, we won't create the ability. Next, when we actually pick up the ability, what we'll do is set that picked up field to true. 
Here's what's happening here, and it's pretty interesting. The entities actually stay persistent between levels. So what you can do is actually store information to each of the entities, and it'll persist between levels. I use this in my game The King's Dungeon to make sure that the doors stay open after you open them. Now you'll see that after I pick up an ability and I leave the room and come back, the ability is still gone. Now we've implemented all the mechanics that I wanted to cover in this video, but there's still one last thing missing. The issue is if you press the jump button right before you hit the ground, you won't be jumping. However, it feels really weird not to have a jump come out when you think that you press the A button when you touch the ground, when really you touched it right before you touched the ground. So we'll be adding something in called the jump buffer. For the jump buffer, let's create some new properties. First is the jump buffer amount, and the next is a counter to keep track of the jump buffer. Here's the strategy for the jump buffer. When the player presses A, we're gonna set the jump buffer to the jump buffer amount. And every frame, we're gonna reduce the jump buffer by one. If the player touches the ground before the jump buffer reaches zero, then we'll count that as a jump and have the player jump. Overall, it should be pretty simple. First, let's create a couple new methods. The first method will handle updating the jump buffer. As I mentioned before, every frame we're going to reduce the jump buffer by one until it reaches zero. Next, if the player just pressed the A button, then we'll set the jump buffer to the jump buffer amount. And the next method that we'll implement is a method to tell if the player jumped by checking the jump buffer. Let's go ahead and update the jump buffer in the update loop. Next, in the input methods, we can replace the A button checks with a jump buffer check. And lastly, when we jump, we'll clear the jump buffer. Now, if you jump right before you touch the ground, you'll still do a jump. One last thing I want to cover in regards to the code is something that happens when you actually upload it onto the playdate. So the process of actually loading the playdate level is quite slow on device, but there is a way to speed it up. The LDTK library allows you to pre-compute levels, but the process is a little involved. So let me show you how to do it. First, you need to determine if the playdate is in simulator or non-simulator mode. We can store that into a local variable called use pre-computed levels. We can check if we're in the simulator mode using the is simulator property. Next, instead of this false boolean, we can use the use pre-computed levels variable. And lastly, if the playdate is in simulator mode, we can pre-compute the levels by calling the export to Luo files function on the LDTK library. The next part involves a few steps and requires us to move some files around. First, you should make sure that your LDTK level is saved. Then you're gonna want to build and run the game. Once it's actually built, you wanna go into File and Reveal Data Folder. In the data folder that's been opened, you're gonna to want to find your project. My project is over here and you should be able to find a folder called LDTK underscore Lua underscore levels. What you wanna do is take this folder and drag and drop it into your levels folder in your project. This should copy it over. Next, if you rebuild the project and upload it to your device, it should load way faster now. You do need to repeat this process of opening the data folder and copying the LDTK Lua levels folder into your project every time you change the level and you wanna test on device. But if you're just testing in the simulator, you can just save the LDTK level and it'll update automatically. There is currently a bug with pre-computed levels in the LDTK library that sometimes makes it so collisions doesn't work properly and you fall right through the floor. I submitted a pull request to fix it, but in the meantime, if you're running into the issue, you can go into the LDTK library file 
and change line 626 into this. This fix will be in the GitHub repo for this tutorial as well. Here's an example of something you can make with this system. While I'm working through this, I wanna go over some caveats of the system. The first one is that the jump system doesn't actually work like in other games. In most games, if you run off the platform, it uses up your jump. In this platformer controller, you retain your jump. For example, if I run off this block, I can still jump. This means you don't have to implement coyote time, but it's not as intuitive. Also, in a lot of games, you don't respawn at exactly where you enter the room, but somewhere near it, so that might be something you want to change. Next is that there are, of course, some common platforming elements missing, like a ladder or wall jumps, as well as losing health instead of resetting and a saving and loading system. I had to implement a custom save and load system in order to make sure that everything that you picked up would not be respawned. If you do want to take a look at the King's Dungeon source code, it's available on my Patreon. This is the second best way to support the channel. The best way to support the channel is just by subscribing. It takes a lot of work to make these videos, and I know for a fact that these tutorials get way less views than my devlogs, but I want to provide more Playdate development resources because I think this community is awesome. So if you found any of my tutorials helpful, then I would really appreciate your sub. The last thing top of mind is the tile size. As I mentioned before, the 16x16 16 16 is a little bit small for the Playdate screen, so you'll probably want to go with a bigger tile size. Something like 32 by 32, similar to what I did in the King's Dungeon, or 24 by 24. You can also create a scrolling screen, but that's beyond the scope of this video. If you're running into issues, I would first recommend comparing your source code to mine. You can do this easily by going to the GitHub link in the description and just going into my code and copying a file. What you can then do is go to a website called diffchecker.com and you can copy paste your code on the left side and then my code on the right side, and you can click this to find the difference and it will highlight what's different about the code. I'll link that in the description. You can also ask questions in the comments, but for anything that's more involved or something to do with your code, I would strongly, strongly recommend joining my Discord because it's way easier to help you there since you can format code snippets and share files. Anyways, thanks for watching and see you next time.